This tutorial is for machine learning fans of all skill levels who want to use Unity to create synthetic training images. No Unity experience is required. I'll guide you through the basics. Beginner experience with FastAI and PyTorch is recommended to follow along with the image segmentation notebook. This video is the first in a series exploring domain randomization and simulated images for deep learning. All right, everyone. So we're going to get started by looking up the open source ML image synthesis package that Unity has uh, provided. So uh, it says here, the aim of this is to help machine learning and computer vision researchers to generate annotated training sets in Unity and on the cloud. So we can see they have an example car simulator here and how they're automatically generating an annotated image with different object ideas or categories, depth, optical flow. Now for this tutorial, we're gonna focus on uh, the category labeling. So make sure you have Unity installed. If not, just uh, go to the Unity site and download their free version. So get started. And there's a personal edition that you can try for free. So I like to use Unity Hub, which is a nice way of uh, managing your Unity installations. So you can uh, download the different versions 2018.2.3 uh, you can look up beta versions so for this tutorial uh, if you want to follow along exactly I'm going to be using 2018.3.2 um, the other thing we want to do is download the image synthesis repo so let's do that right there Let's go into our downloads, extract that. Let's give it a easier name, image synth part one. All right, so back to Unity Hub, we can actually open that folder Select folder. Uh, make sure your 2018.3.2 version of Unity is highlighted. And it's going to ask us to upgrade because this uh, package was made with Unity 5.5. So let's do that. And then I'm going to fast forward. All right, so, so we have uh, the project loaded. Now what we want to do is go into their examples and load up the test scene. And we can see a bunch of cubes here. So if we start playing that, um, we see some cubed movements. Now what we want to do to make this easier is drag the game tab to create the split. Um, and then we want to uh, add a new tab, a new game tab, and drag that to create another split. All right, so when we play it again, so we have our uh, game view here. So what the image synthesis script does for us is gives us these different displays where we can see an annotated version of the image. So for example, you can see a blue cube and a yellow cube representing different class types. Um, there's some other more advanced annotations here. Um, I think you can see the blink of movement for optical flow. So we really care about display three, which is our category labels. 
So um, there's this button here. Let's press that. Uh, so that's going to actually take a screenshot. So if we go right click on our assets and show an explorer, we can actually see uh, the images here. So the actual image and the layers, normals, uh, ID, flow, depth. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, that's all we need to create our training data. So we just need to customize this. I mean, the scene isn't the best for training data as it doesn't really have different types of visibly different classes. So let's uh, create a new scene. So right click here, create a new scene, and let's call it solids. So what we're gonna do is create a bunch of training examples with different types of 3D solids like cubes or spheres and cylinders, uh, which are convenient because Unity has that built in. So let's get started. So we can right click here and create a 3D cube. So there's some arrows to move that around. Let's also create a sphere and a cylinder. All right. So uh, let me just give you some quick tips with working with the scene view. So if you hold down your right mouse button and use the WASD keyboard uh, keys, you can actually move around like a video game, like a first person shooter. And you can also use Q to go down and E to go up. So I would play around with that until you get used to it. It's gonna come in handy. Now over to the left side, you can see the hierarchy view. And this is just another way of looking at all the objects in the scene. So you can actually select the objects here, which is useful whenever there's like a hidden object or you just can't find it visually. All right, let's try running the game. So we don't have anything in the display, display three right now. And that's because we actually haven't added any of the image synth code yet. So what we want to do is look into our image synth folder. Let's also minimize well, make the icon sizes smaller. So that's a little easier to find things. And we have our image synth script right here. And you can see the C sharp code. So let's click on our main camera. So what we actually want to do is drag, whoops, drag image synthesis over. So now, when we play the game again, we actually see the objects in Display 3, although there aren't any labels yet, so they're all white. So let's remedy that by going to Layers, editing those, and let's add a new layer for each category type. So we have cube, sphere, and cylinder. Okay, and then let's go one by one through each object that we have in the scene and set the layer. Cylinder, and let's try again. Cool. 
So we have red for cube, green for so sphere, and blue for cylinder. Okay, so, and we can move them around and see a change. So the next thing we want to do, we're going to want many versions, well, many different solids in our scene at a time. So a bunch of cubes and a bunch of spheres or cylinders. And this is going to help train a neural network that can detect wherever these shapes are, no matter how they are, they're arranged, how many of them are on the screen. So we want to create something called a prefab, which basically lets you create clones of objects in Unity. So let's create a new folder called prefabs. And then we can just drag each object there. And you can see, so we can drag each prefab and you'll notice the layers are probably properly set. So when we play it, we should see the colored labels. So what happens when we add another one? Oh, hmm. So you can see it is rendering something, but in black. So it doesn't really have a colored label. And that's because our image synthesis script needs to be updated. Well, it needs to be notified whenever an object enters or exits the scene. So that's going to require some coding. So let's try that out. So just to keep things organized, let's create a new scripts folder. Go in there, right click and create a new C sharp script. Let's call this scene controller. And double click to open that up. So that's uh, Visual Studio. You might have Mono Develop if you're on a different platform. All right, so I'm going to drag this off to the side, increase the font size. Okay, so you can see here we have our scene controller class which is a type of mono behavior. And this lets us hook into the Unity uh, component system. So we have a start method that's called uh, one time at the beginning and an update method, which is called each frame. So what we want to do is create a placeholder for the image synthesis object because we need to notify it whenever we update the scene. So in Unity, when you create a public variable on a mono behavior, you actually get a slot in the UI. So first, we want to create an empty game object. Let's call that scene control and we want to drag our scene controller um, script there. Oh, so remember to save. So it's going to compile and then we're going to see the, oh, yeah, the updated field. So it's looking for an image synthesis object and we uh, remember we added that to our main camera right here. So what we want to do is drag the camera into that slot. So now we have a reference to a synth that we can use in our code. 
So our original reason for doing that was to call on scene change. Okay, save. Let's uh, play the game again. Let's look at our prefabs. Take some up. Oh. So as soon as we add the new object, we can see the label show up. So yeah, that's uh, exactly what we want. Uh, and if you're looking at it closely, you're probably thinking that this is pretty inefficient because we're not adding new objects every frame, but we'll uh, optimize that later. Okay, so uh, while we're here, let's take a look at some of the um, things we can do to these objects. So when we're creating our training data, we're going to want to have different positions of objects and different rotations and scales, uh, different camera positions and, you know, different colors, textures. But let's focus on the actual transforms to the objects. So, you know, when we click an object, we get these arrows that let us move on the X, Y, or Z axis. So in Unity, Y is up. So this little gizmo can remind you of which axis is which. So if we press the E button on the keyboard, we can move into rotation mode. So a similar thing, we can restrict rotations to a particular axis. And if we press R, we can move to uh, scale mode, of which this gray box in the middle lets us scale uniformly across all axes. And the shortcut for a position for moving an object is W. So that brings us back to the repositioning arrows. So the other useful thing we can do is align our camera with our scene view. So you can see our scene and game views are different. But if we select our camera, and go to game object, align with view. You can see that our views are now the same. So align with view. Okay. So we have our labels with that view as well. Uh, so when we're creating images for our training sets, uh, we want to have a fixed size resolution uh, that we send our batches of data to the neural network training. So right now it might say free aspect, but we can create a new resolution. And for this particular project, let's do 512 by 512 and let's set our display 3 to that as well all right so everything is nice and square which I believe GPUs like so now that we've seen how this works with manually placed and rotated objects. Uh, we want to move to randomizing these objects with a script. So let's go ahead and delete these objects. So I'm just going to drag a box through these. Uh, make sure you don't have the camera light or scene control selected. And let's just edit 
delete or use your delete key. And just to keep things simple for this uh, project, we're just going to assume the camera is always facing down. Uh, and we can use a 3D plane to represent that. So the plane acts as the floor. Let's uh, set our position to 0, 0, 0. Let's take our camera and set that position to x0, z0. Um, let's do y20, so 20 units up. And our rotation should be 90 for the x-axis and 0 for the y. So you can see our camera is looking down at the plane. And let's uh, make this plane a little bigger by using our scale tool. Kind of want to go to around, around 5 on each axis. And let's uh, spice things up a bit by giving a color to the plane. So we're going to use something that Unity calls materials. And let's keep things organized as always. And let's create a new material called floor. Let's drag that over. So materials let you control things like the color and you know how shiny shiny the objects are, different metallic properties. Um, you can create uh, different effects like 3D effects with normal maps and height maps. Um, you can use textures, uh, photorealistic textures or other types of imagery, but let's just keep it simple and let's create a grayish floor. Okay, so make sure you have your material set up. Okay, so with Unity, uh, we can take advantage of the physics engine that's built in to simulate gravity so that we can place objects in a natural way. So to do this, we need to add rigid body components to our geometric solid prefab. So if we go to our prefabs and double click on one of them, go to add component and search for rigid body and go one by one through those prefabs. So a rigid body in Unity just means that this object should participate in the physics simulation. And you'll see what I mean. So if we create an object, uh, we have our floor, and our floor has a collider. So that means rigid bodies will collide with the floor. Oof. And we can kind of play with that. It's kind of fun. And we have our sphere here. So rigid bodies can also collide with one another. So for example, if we take this sphere and move it off to the side a little bit, you'll see it hit the edge of the cube and starts rolling. 
So that's pretty cool. So now that we know the basics of how to place different objects and use the physics simulation, rigid bodies, we want to start coding up a script that will uh, randomize a bunch of these things for us. So let's go back into our scene controller. Uh, let's put this side by side. So what we want to do is create a uh, field for a list of game objects, an array of game objects called prefabs. And if we save that, um, this is where we're going to let our script know which sort of prefabs we want to be able to create. So we have three of them. And let's create that array and drag our prefabs over one by one. I believe we're doing cube, sphere, and cylinder in that order. And then we want to create a method called generate random. So the first thing we want to do is pick out a prefab. Actually, we also want to have an int field called max objects just to uh, specify how many objects to generate uh, every time generate random is called. So let's create a for loop from zero to max objects and then we're actually going to pick up the prefab in here. So that's a prefab index. So we want to pick a random number between 0 and prefabs dot length. And then we want to actually get the prefab by looking it up in the prefabs array. So you can see I used a var here and just to take advantage of C sharp's type inference, but we could also do a control plus in Visual Studio to put the actual type there. Okay, so now that we picked out a prefab, we want to pick a random position. So that's going to require an x, y, and z floating point variable. And this should be, well, if we look at our camera and try and move this around, we can see that's negative 10 in the Z, positive 10, and we also have negative 10 in the X and 10. So that's a good range. So let's go from negative 10 to 10. Uh, the Y we actually want to drop these objects either a little bit above the floor or let's just say 10 units up. So let's go from two, two units up to 10 units. So we create our actual position that's a vector three of new x, new y, new z. Okay, 
So we want to now create the actual object. And we do that by creating a new object. Um, instantiate. Give it the prefab. The new position. So according to this, we're going to want a new rotation. All right, let's create a new rotation. So new rotation. And luckily we have a random rotation variable here. And let's see what happens. Oh, forgot to actually call generate random. Let's get rid of these two objects here. And play. All right, so it looks like we generated a bunch. They're all the same size and color, but at least it's working. So, now that we've created position, rotation, last one is scale. So we want to create a new scale, which is a, actually let's call that scale factor. So that's Let's say they can either be half as big, 0 0.5, to four times as big. And our new scale is also a vector 3. Scale factor. Uh, maybe let's give that, let's refactor that. Let's rename that SX. So to actually set the scale, we want to look at our new object. Let's look at the transform field and local scale equals new scale. Let's run that and see what happens. Cool. So small objects and big objects. So last thing we want here is color. So colors are new red, new green, and new blue value. So we create so new so random as always. So these require a floating point number in between 0 and 1 instead of 0 and 255. So let's paste that. Let's set our new color to be a new color of new R, new G, new B. Now, how can we actually set the color on each new object? So we actually need to get the reference to that, that object's material. So new object, and that happens to be on this thing called a renderer component. So we can do get component of type renderer, if we call that we can now access its properties and we want material dot color. Let's set that to new color. Save that and play. Awesome. So we got a bunch of different colors. The labels are all good. All right. 
So we've now created a scene controller script that can generate us a bunch of random objects, but only one time. So what happens when we need to create a new set of objects each frame? Well, we need a way to get rid of these objects. So let's just do the, the easy thing right now and create a, an array of game objects called created. So in our uh, an array of game object, in our start method, we want to set that to a new game object array, game object, and we set the size to max objects. Uh, now whenever we generate random, we want to go through each object. So if we actually created something not equal null, then we want to destroy that object. So now, when we instantiate the object, we want to let our created array know that that belongs there. And now we can move generate random into our update method. Let's see what happens. Whoa, okay, so we're generating a bunch of objects and getting the labels really quickly, which is pretty much what we want to do at Unity to help us with our, our training data creation. Now the problem here is we can actually see this with our profiler. This is going to cause memory problems. So if we click on memory and we run the game, memory. Uh, we can see that the memory usage is just going up and up because we're not destroying the objects faster than we're creating them. Uh, Unity's garbage collector isn't going fast enough for what we need. So that's going to be a problem, especially in cases where we want to generate tens of thousands, hundred thousands, or even millions of random images. So we need to find a clever way to deal with this problem. And one way of doing that in Unity is with something called object pooling. So, so this, this one is going to be a bit more involved, so feel free to, to copy the code from our GitHub repo. repo. But what we want to do here is create a new script called, let's call it shape pool. And let's go into that. So we don't want shape pool to be a mono behavior. We want to use something more lightweight, a scriptable object. Let's get rid of our start and update methods. So in our shape pool, what we want to do, well first, let's add some helper enums and classes. We want to create an enum for shape label. So we want to queue sphere and cylinder. We also want to create a shape class. So this is going to package together a shape label and a game object. So in our shape pool class, we want we want to create a prefabs array 
because each type of prefab is going to have a different pool of cached objects. We want to create, well, this could just be private, a dictionary where we map a shape label to a list of shapes. Then let's call that pools. And finally, we want to create a list of our active objects. So with scriptable objects, we can't use a constructor directly, but we can create a um, static initializer pool. <laughs> object prefabs. So we, we use scriptable object dot create instance of shape pool and we set each one of the fields oh my bad it should be prefabs to prefabs, we set pools to a new dictionary. We want to iterate through um, all our prefabs and create shape thing. a new list for that part of the dictionary. And finally, we want to create a new empty list for active and return the object we just created. Okay. So the real workhorse of this class is our get method, which is going to return shape and we want to say which shape we actually want so in this method we're either going to create a new object or and then once having created that add it to our pool of objects of that type or we can look through that pool see if there are any free ones and just return that. So let's get our pool. Shape. What's that there? Label. And we want to look up the last index. Set a return shape. Let me just scroll down. So there's two cases. So if the last index is less than or equal to zero, we don't have any objects in the pool yet. So we just want to instantiate one of those prefabs. And we want to annotate our return shape with the actual class where we set the label to label and object to object. Uh, otherwise, we can set the return shape to the last index of the pool we can set active. So active means that this object is on the screen or not. And then we want to remove the object from the pool. 
so we're also keeping track of which objects are active so let's add the returned object and actually return this object cool so the final thing to help us is we're going to need a reclaim all method it's basically going to look at all the active objects uh, make them inactive to remove them from the screen and return them to the pools so that's for each shape and active we want to set them to not active we want to add it back to the proper pool and finally we want to clear the active list okay so this is our shape pool class let's uh, update our scene controller so we don't want a created array anymore we want a shape pool shape let's just call it pool so we don't need this anymore but we want to use the static create method pass in prefabs uh, in generate random we don't want to do this because we have a way easier method called pool dot reclaim all and so instead of instantiating the object manually we can actually do pool dot get and cast our prefab index okay so since we're not instantiating it here we need to uh, set our position and rotation somehow so let's just do that directly on the new object dot arms transform dot position equals position but new pause and transform dot rotation equals new rot and actually let's call this shape and new odd should be shape dot odd. so we don't have to do this double lookup Okay, let's play that and see what happens. Right, let's open up our profiler. So, so we can see the memory is pretty stable around 328. Um, there might be some uh, leakage right now we might not be reusing our materials uh, properly but it's still way better than before and we're going to be able to generate tons of images this way so let's stop this and uh, be sure to save uh, frequently also your project and Let's see what we have up next. Okay, so right now we're taking one frame per configuration, but we did set up that physics engine earlier. So what if we could run the physics engine
for a certain number of frames before generating a new set of random uh, shapes. Um, We can do that by creating a frame count variable set to zero. Now, whenever the frame count, let's say we want to update every 30 frames. So whenever that is divisible by 30 evenly, let's do that. Let's also remember to increment frame count. So this on scene change, uh, before we were doing it every frame, but now we know we only change the scene at the end of generate random. So let's actually just put that there. Okay, let's uh, play this again. So, so we can see we get some 30 frames of simulation before moving to a next uh, configuration. So we're always generating 10 objects in the scene, but what if we generated a random amount of objects every time we called generate random? So an amount in between min objects, and max objects, let's say 50. So instead of doing a loop from i equals zero to max objects, let's create objects this time. So that's a random number in between min objects and max objects. So let's just update that in the loop objects this time, save that, let's just see, okay, so this max objects didn't get updated, so sometimes when you change um, the number in the code, it doesn't update it in the inspector automatically. And if we play Okay, so now there's a variable number of objects per generation. Awesome. So we're getting close to being done with the Unity side of things. Um, but before moving on to, to Python and neural network training, we actually need to save the images to the disk. So we can do that with our handy image synthesis component in synth.save. So we need a file name. Our width is 512, height is 512. Um, let's put these all in a folder called captures. So if we right click on this and look in our file explorer, Let's create a folder, new folder called captures. Let's just delete these images here. Let's uh, create our file name so we can use string interpolation with the dollar sign image underscore. Uh, frame count. We also want to add some padding to that of five zeros. And then there. So let's run this. our captures. Let's run that. Oh, okay, cool. So 
Here are all the images. So for instance, our original image and our layer mask. So we're actually generating way more than we need to. We only need uh, those two types of images. So let's uh, update the code for that. So generating all these images, extra images, slows down um, the image generation as well. So let's go into our save. And if we look at through these save methods, we see this save function that actually goes through each pass in capture passes. And if we look at that, um, we have all the different displays that we were looking at before, the image, ID layer, depth, normals flow. So we only care about the image and layer. So items zero and two. So if we go back to our save method, what if we created a specific pass? Uh, integer, which could be negative one for the default behavior. Otherwise, we would want to save the first capture pass, which is the original image and also save specific pass. So because we changed this uh, argument, we need to propagate it through the chain of calls. Specific pass. Um, this where we do it? Okay, so here we can give it a default value of negative one. Oops, specific pass. So coming back to our scene controller, we can now add the specific pass. Well, let's just do two. So now when we run this, let's see what we have. Yep, so just image and layer. Let's see. Okay, so we want to create a training set and a validation set. So let's have a way to specify how many training images we want. Well, let's just do that. And validation images. Okay. Mm, we also want to only update We want to log our frame count. Okay, so let's do our training images first. So if the frame count is less than training images, then let's put these in captures slash train. Otherwise, if the frame count is less than training images plus 
val images. Let's whoops. Let's put these in captures.val. So we want to let's just uh, say our val frame count is equal to the frame count minus training images. So change this to val frame count. What's going on here? Oops, did I forget something? Oh, else if. Okay, and we don't even want to do any of these unless the frame count is less than training images plus val images. Let's put that in there. Let's format the document. Let's delete all of these. Let's create a new folder called train and a new folder called val. Let's say we want to generate 100, well, 200 training images and 100 validation images. So not realistic, but bear with me. Um, in our console, we can see the frame count increasing and it should stop. Oop, oop. That's not good. Um, frame count is less than. Well, anyway, we have our train images. So that went up to 200. And we have our validation images, which went up to 99. So that's good enough. I'll, I'll fix that later. Um, let's see. So finally, the last thing is um, you notice back to our images, we have this nice um, human readable colors, but the fast AI image segmentation network actually requires uh, sort of a grayscale label to color mapping. So for instance, class eight would be RGB 888 instead of a nice color. So what if we had two modes um, to let us toggle between those, so grayscale. And to see where the actual uh, colors get encoded, that's in our image synthesis on scene change method. We can see there's a method here called encode layer as color, which sets a category color. Let's go in here. So this is probably a good place where we can add a grayscale argument. So grayscale, do this, otherwise do what we were doing. So let's just move that there, format document. So what we want to do is just return a new color of uh, the layer divided by 255.0f because we need a color between 0 and 1 floating point. Okay, so back to our scene controller. Let's pass in our 
grayscale. So by default, let's say that's false. Um, and maybe we'll also have a save. So we should only save if that is checked. So let's just move that in here. Format document, let's save that. Oh, looks like we have some problems. Return color. Oh, let's just move that up here. Okay. What's this? Oh, oh this needs a Boolean called grayscale. And add that grayscale. Save. Let's try again. So let's hear. Start on scene change. Uh, let's just give this a default value. Okay. So errors are gone. Let's let's not save. Let's run this. So we got a nice colors. We go to grayscale. You can see very light shades. And I think we're ready to generate our set of training images. So let's delete what we created before. Train and Val. And I believe we want to create, let's do 2,000 training images and 400 validation images with grayscale and save. Um, let's frame count. Okay. And let's try running that again. And I'll fast forward through this. Okay, so looks like the new frames have stopped. So let's stop the simulator. Uh, let's just check our folders. Looks good, validation, training. Okay, so now I need to get these images to my uh, AI server. So I have a Ubuntu system on my local uh, network with a nice GPU. So let's just uh, let's see. So image synth part one. Um, so we have captures, so I want to rsync that, mm, the nice progress bar to my local machine and let me know if there are more efficient ways of doing this. Image synth data. Okay, so I'll fast forward this too. All right, so our uh, transfer is complete. So here's where we go into our Jupyter Notebook. So this is running on my AI machine. 
let's go into the notebook. So hopefully you already have a fast AI installed and PyTorch, well, everything you need um, for that project. And uh, if you have a GPU, um, you have that set up as well. So let's just uh, go through this. I believe I have uh, image synth data. So this notebook is actually a uh, variation of one of the notebooks in the latest version of the FastAI course. So in lesson three, there's a uh, image segmentation uh, tutorial using the the cam vid data set so this is pretty similar just a little modifications to uh, make it work smoothly with our new data set so here I take a look at some of the training images and um, annotations there's the actual image so with our data set, um, the only difference between the actual image and its annotation is changing IMG to layer. So our get Y function does that. Let's uh, take a look at the mask here. Okay, so uh, so not not the clearest colors. Uh, not the most distinct, but I guess you can tell. So, so cylinders have this yellowish color, and spheres are uh, lime green, and cubes are a darker green. So let's just um, continue. So our list of codes corresponds to the different layers we have in Unity. So. If you remember, the user layer started at eight. So, oh, this should probably be cube, sphere, cylinder. I, I believe that's what we're doing here. Cube, sphere, cylinder, okay. So our size is our training size. So our images are 512 by 512. So we're going to be training them at 256, batch size of eight. Um, here we're using FastAI's uh, nice data blocks uh, API. Uh, so we're looking in our uh, data path folder. We're grabbing all the images and splitting them into train and val uh, by folder. And we're getting the labels with our get y function function which just changes the image img to to layer we're doing um, you know basic transforms so you, you can play around with those if you want if we show one of our batches you can kind of see Okay, so let's go to the actual training. We have the segmentation accuracy that checks to make sure each pixel is labeled properly. Um, we have our UNet learner. Now we're going through the learning rate finder. Okay, let's start training at about one to the negative three. Okay, 
So it looks like we're getting about 94% accuracy on our validation set. Let's um, see what that looks like. So using show results, uh, comparing ground truth to predictions, uh, we can see these look pretty much similar except for for this area you can see there's kind of um, some uncertainty about this part of the cube mm. what else hmm. I guess these are happen to be good examples let's look at those in a different way Okay, so we have our, our cylinder, cylinders and spheres, the unique colors and cubes. Um, and you can see this confusion of thinking that the cylinder goes into this cube. So there's also some confusion here, but I actually can't even tell what that shape is supposed to be. So I I suppose with simpler scenes, uh, the segmentation will be more accurate. Uh, okay, so that's about that with this tutorial. Uh, in the future, I, I hope to cover things like randomized textures and lighting conditions, different camera angles, um, and hopefully maybe importing 3D models and hopefully uh, trying domain randomization techniques on uh, a more sophisticated data set to see what sort of results we can get compared to uh, state of the art. So thanks for joining me. Take care.